Um, hello, my name is Becky Lancaster and I am a Family Support Specialist with Uplift, which is Wyoming's Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health Services. I am also a parent and a grandparent of children who have special needs. And as a family, we've navigated the special ed system, the medical system, and the criminal justice system. Um, so we would like to, um, on behalf of Wyoming Family to Family Information Center, which is a collaboration between Wyoming Institute for Disabilities and Uplift, we're here today to bring you a presentation on the importance of well-being and mental health for you and your child with special health care needs. Um, this is a really important topic. Many parents have questions in regards to the mental health well-being of their children and their families, when to worry, when not to worry, and maybe some strategies on how best to address things. Here with me today is our University of Wyoming partner, um, Dr. Ann Bowen, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, who is our faculty partner, and I'm going to turn it over to her and let her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Ann Bowen. I'm a, a clinical psychologist, and I work currently in the School of Nursing at the University of Wyoming. Um, and my interest is both um, health care and psychological needs of children and families. And today we're going to talk about, sort of cover some of the developmental issues in wellness and um, well-being for families with children with special health care needs. Um, so I think we could start off just talking about what is mental health. And the definition really is a state of well-being where the individual can cope with the stresses of daily life, whatever age that person may be, that the, the individual realizes his or her own abilities, what they can and can't do, to work productively, including going to school, activities around the home that need to be done, um, and then gainful employment as an adult, and then contributing to the community, and again, at whatever um, level they're capable. So, so we're going to talk mostly today about well-being and how to promote well-being and mental health in children as they grow up through adolescence. Um, what we do see with families and, and children with chronic um, illness or, or special health care needs is there is an increased risk for mental health and adjustment problems. And those are especially acute with children that have neurological or developmental conditions. Among men and boys, more so than women, have more risk of mental health problems. Um, if there are visible disabilities, with families with mental health, with other mental health problems, families that have minimal support system and lowered financial resources. So there, while it's still somewhat, it's not a given that every family that has a special health care need will have mental health, health issues, it's about twice as likely. And, and I think it's important just for families to be aware of these um, so they can begin to really look at the risk factors and then to think about what could be put in place to help um, address or maybe we talk about risk and protective factors. Um, and when I was preparing this talk for this presentation and, and talking to Becky about it, one of the resources that I found that was really, really helpful is um, the Love and Logic, both their website, they have a book for parenting um, children with health and issues and special needs, and a couple of their basic principles that they, would, they recommend that parents consider is the, the goals of trying to build your child's self-esteem, um, which is important to that you set up high but reasonable expectations for your child. Um, and this will, uh, their, their self-concept will grow if they're allowed to do tasks that they can do and do well. And so a job well done. Um, another principle, I think, just overall general principles, is to share control with your child. Provide, or your, or your young adult, um, to provide healthy choices, 
to use enforceable statements. Don't suggest they're grounded for life if you're not going to enforce that. Um, have empathy but, and logical consequences and, and be willing to repeat those consequences until your point is made. Um, and with that, you have to swallow your frustration. Can you outstubborn your child? Um, and then finally, shared thinking and problem solving. Explain to your child what, you, what you're thinking, what you're observing, and give them ideas and guidance, but without dictating specific things they have to do. And, and I think another piece of that is the parents having a really clear idea of the definition between loving your child unconditionally and rescuing your child. Um, when we talk about logical consequences, um, sometimes even kids who have um, special needs can still be naughty and still need to have boundaries set. And it's important that you always love your child unconditionally, but understanding that we don't do them, you know, for their mental health and their social emotional development, we don't do them any favors by not holding them accountable. I think something you said to me earlier about picking your battles mm -hmm. and choosing your mountain to die on is something to keep in mind. I think that was a great um, description of where we're going here. So then, so then just in that realm, um, here's some things to just keep in mind as you negotiate the caring for an individual with special health care needs, that all parents and caregivers feel overwhelmed at times. It's normal to feel overwhelmed. Um, and give yourself room to learn and to make mistakes. Um, and probably the hardest one is parenting strategies don't always develop as fast as the children do. You finally have something working and they're past it. So you have to change again. Um, and that parenting is a balancing act between guiding and helping your child be in more independent and autonomous. And then finally, each developmental transition offers an opportunity for growth, but also conflict. So keep that in mind as you take this journey. And then, and then I think this is the thing I try to remember, is that, that happiness is a tr way of traveling. It's not an end point. And I think it's important to um, balance your bad days and your good days, that, you know, for all of us, if you've never had a bad day, you really can't cherish and celebrate the good days. And so happiness is, is pretty subjective and helping our kids get there is important, but it's a step-by-step -step process. And, and we can't do it for them. They have to travel this road as well. Um, so now we want to talk a little bit, we're going to talk a little bit about different stages of child development and how to help kids have well-being and feel happy more of the time than unhappy. And I think the thing that parents and, and caregivers need to remember is that this individual is a child first and a chronic, has a chronic illness second. You need to think about what this child needs to accomplish to be successful as a child, not as someone who has diabetes or someone who has epilepsy because the child part is, is the most important piece for well-being and success. So build a plan that focuses on one or two important developmental goals, and this will help both you and your child reduce stress and grow in a healthy direction. In other words, if you're trying to solve everything at once, you're not going to get there. <laughs> so pick your, pick your battle, pick your goal, pick your focus. Set your priorities. Exactly. Um, and then setting limits for your child because happiness, happy kids know their boundaries. They know where they're supposed to be. They aren't always trying to be on top or to figure out when it's okay to um, cross the street and when it's not. <laughs> um, and that helps them learning to interact with others as well as developing emotional control, which as you'll see is a key. And when we talk about social emotional development or mental health um, for children, for everyone. There's a lot of research out there that talks about kids who have very clear boundaries, who have very clear expectations, who have structure and routine in their world. Actually, that's a security for them. Um, when children are allowed to 
just kind of do whatever, run amok, if you will, um, it really doesn't add to their sense of security and well-being. So by setting boundaries and setting limits with kids, we are actually helping their social-emotional development. Agreed 100%. So let's talk a little bit. Let's start with infants. And, and as we think about trying to choose a developmental goal, really infants, the primary goal is attachment to their caregiver, to their parent, um, and to other adults in their life. And I think the key for parents to remember is to lovingly and promptly pick up your infant when they're crying. And I mean, what this results in is less crying, more self-soothing by the infant, a faster response to parental soothing, and secure and organized attachments. And whenever I tell this to parents, usually, this is, we're talking an infant from to about six months to a year, and often parents will ask me, well, isn't this going to spoil my baby if I pick him up all the time? Well, keep in mind, up till six months or a year, kids don't manipulate. Kids cry for a reason. So helping them cope with it is important in this stage and, and helps them, especially I think the, the self-soothing question. They know that it's coming. They can, they can control themselves longer. And I think with that also is that that's a form of communication for babies. And so as, as they're growing and developing, crying and having those needs met are their first way of communicating with their primary caregivers. So when they get a positive response, when their needs are met, that encourages the child to communicate more, which then builds on that foundation, um, that relationship, that communication with parents or caregivers. So here's some of the challenges that we see for infants who also have a chronic illness. Um, the challenges are the separations due to hospitalization, um, painful procedures, and the, trying to develop a regular schedule. We have sleep wake cycles. Um, and so helping kids deal with those things and remembering you can't do it for them, but you can help them and be there for them. Um, but you will see some difficulties if kids are separated in the hospital a lot, but it can be overcome. It's not a, it's not a attachment that your child will never attach. And I think it's important that if, if your child is hospitalized for you know, a short time or an extended period of time that um, you really advocate at the hospital or with a social worker you know, how you can spend time. They, um, I have to say that the hospitals have gotten much, much better with allowing parents to stay, um, to be able to just be there to hold the babies, to touch the babies. And, but I think it's important as parents that don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to say, you know, can I come in? When can I come in? What's, you know, what's the rules? And are they flexible? Um, because sometimes when our children are really sick, we tend to turn all of their care over to the medical people, and we forget that we still can ask questions and advocate for our, for our babies. Um, and, and along with those challenges of, of overriding a system that wants to take control for us, um, there's also just the financial stresses, the disruption of routines, um, the, your feelings of loss and grief that parents have when they find their child has a chronic illness, um, and then the feeling that your child is too sick to have limits. And as they come out of infancy into toddlerhood, you've really got to remember their children first. They need limits, and being sick... Well, I had an adolescent tell me once that whenever her parents let her not go to school because she was too sick, it was a sign to her that she was going to die. So she was like, make us go to school. So we're talking infants here, but it starts in infancy. And kind of talking about the feelings of loss and grief, um, parents don't always understand that they are in a grieving process. You know, we understand that if a child, if you physically lose a child, everybody knows there's a grieving process. But we need to recognize, and parents need to recognize, that when your child is sick or when they have um, a special need or they have a disability, there is that grieving process for the loss of the dream. This is not what I planned. And sometimes parents ignore that 
which then can cause difficulties, you know, with their mental health, depression, those types of things. So really understanding that you are grieving, um, even though your child is alive, you're still grieving the plan or the dream. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, it's always okay to ask for help. Absolutely. Um, so for the infant, um, some of the things you know, we start talking about is later in infancy, um, about a year right before they're officially toddlers, but when they do start to manipulate, I think you want to satisfy your child's needs without giving in to senseless demands. And this is a, so if your child is crying because they're in pain or they're wet or they're hungry or they're tired, hold them and comfort them. But as they move into toddlerhood and it becomes because they didn't get a cookie, then some quiet time might be in order. Um, so let's, uh, we've kind of jumped the gun a little bit here, but let's talk about toddlers' developmental goals. And probably the most important thing in the one year to four or five is learning emotional control. And the, the toddler has to learn to control their own emotions. You can't do it for them. Um, but learning to accept no without hitting, kicking, biting, um, is probably the most important thing you can help your child learn at this stage. Um, because children who don't hit have more friends. They're better liked when they get to school and when they're in preschool. And it helps develop their language skills because they figure out ways to ask for what they want rather than hitting and taking it. Um, in most schools, remember the goal of the toddler is to get into kindergarten and, and stay there and not get kicked out. So schools have no hitting policies and if your child bites someone, it's a problem. So I think making that a firm limit um, is an important thing to consider. And then language development in this period where the child switches from crying to pointing, pulling, and then talking. So helping the child make that transition, your child, by setting limits, by not accepting hitting when they want something or, or biting you when they say no, um, is really important. Um, and I do hear a lot of parent concerns about this when parents get frustrated, like, you know, parents shouldn't think that. Like, my child's such a pain in the neck. He's like, it's, he, she, kid, every other child is doing X and mine's not doing that. Well, all parents think those things. And feeling angry and feeling like you're going to lose it are normal as long as you don't lose it. <laughs> and I think it's important to think about that parents need to really learn not to take everything that your child does so personally. Um, I mean, that's key, is if they're hitting you, kicking you, biting you, the goal of that behavior is to get what they want. It's really not because I don't like you, I don't love you. It's the goal of the behavior is I want that cookie or I want that toy. And often parents take it very personally, thinking, you know, my kid doesn't like me. Or if a child is older and they're saying things like, I hate you, they really don't. Again, it's, it's a way of getting whatever it is that they want. So, you know, we really encourage parents not to take everything personally and to really look at what is the goal of this behavior? What is the child getting out of it? Mm -hmm. And be prepared for it because I would say just about every child tries it. Yes. And the I hate you, wish you were dead. Mm -hmm. If it works the first time, they'll keep using it. <laughs> well, I tell a lot of the parents I work with in my parenting classes that, you know, from the day they're born until the day we die and are no longer parenting, because you are a parent your whole life, the goal of a child is to get their parent to mind them. So I think sometimes you have to ask yourself, am I minding my child? That's a great way to think <laughs> about it. <laughs> um, so what can, you, what can you do as a parent? Well, keep in mind your goals and not what's easy. Sometimes when you're out in public and your child is screaming and yelling and hanging off your leg and you really would like to just give them that piece of candy so they'll be quiet, um, that's the easy answer, but not the goal of helping your child develop emotional control. And when we do that, we actually teach our children how to misbehave. Then we get into <laughs> things with learned behaviors because that they've learned this tantrum equals M&Ms. Yep. And so we have to be really careful that we're not going down that road. 
So not accepting hitting, not giving in to tantrums for the candy bar they don't need. Um, and then I think an important piece for preschoolers is that you, set, you start a, a now setting aside special time. A time when you spend 20, 15 or 20 minutes letting your child choose a game or a play style and you follow along describing what they do, imitating what they're doing when they're toddlers. If they're dri- crawling around driving their truck, you crawl around and drive a truck with them and make truck noises. And also describing what they're doing because it does help with language and what understanding what's going on. Um, So let's move into the elementary school years. Um, The goal here in elementary for the elementary child is essentially the 5 to 12 year old um, is the beginning of autonomy, starting to separate, starting to do more. We've we've got no down in the toddler years. And and so now they're, they're becoming more independent. They're developing peer relations. And then academic achievement at whatever level they're capable is important to be successful. Um, And especially a child with a chronic illness, if they've missed a lot of school, if they've had to be out for various reasons, helping that child develop a plan to talk about their illness at their own level or their disability so they can explain it to other kids because it does help with friendships, with socializing with peers when people start to understand what's going on. So if your child can do that, it's a good time to help them. Starts giving them autonomy to talk about it and explain it. Well, it helps them take some control also. Um, We talk about self-advocacy skills with kids, and it's it's a great foundation for some self-advocacy where if they understand their illness, understand the pros and the cons, what they can and can't do, then often I've seen kids speak up for themselves you know, with their teachers in their classrooms, in the lunch line, you know, um, and and they're very comfortable with it. So, and as a parent, what you can do to help them do some of these things is sort of, this. some of this comes from the Love and Logic Institute as well, but building your child's self-concept, which means empathy, you know, when your child says this isn't fair, it's like, yes, it's not fair, but it is the way it is and to have understanding and love with it and empathic without it being an excuse. Um, and have high but reasonable expectations for your child and allow your child to problem solve at whatever level they're capable of. Um, and share control. Some of that is setting limits, um, teaching your child to accept limits in everyday life and help them, ex- and once they can accept limits, it also helps them with coping with their health problems because they understand how there are limits in the world and everyone has different ones. Um, and then have empathy before you impose consequences. So let them know you, that things that can be unfair and you understand, but use logical consequences whenever possible. And then share thinking and problem solving. And I, and I think other things that parents can do that's really important is how do they manage their own stress. Um, and you have a child that has health care needs or disabilities, um, there's a lot of stress on parents. So I think really building a support system, you know, whatever that means to you, whether it's family, friends, cultural, spiritual, professional, you know, if you need to talk to a professional, your minister, whatever it is to you, um, finding time for yourself, and I know that's easier said than done when you're raising kids, but sometimes even just taking a five-minute block walk around the block can just clear your head and give you a little bit of perspective so you can go back at it again. And one of the things that was really important in my family was to find the funny. We are, you know, keeping a sense of humor and keeping some perspective about things and finding the funny um, kind of short story. I, my daughter was very ill as a baby and had to have her stomach... She had major surgery when she was uh, about five and a half months old. And she had this horrible color, and I used to call her my little Smurfette because she was kind of blue. And I thought it was funny. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know if everybody else did, but I think as parents we have to find ways just to lighten the mood 
and to do what what we can to do that. Um, it's important, you know, for mental health. And so, really managing your stress as a parent is is key when you're when you're parenting children who have special needs or chronic health issues. And I think your advice you mentioned, if you um, are having a really bad day, go find the funniest movie you can find mm -hmm. and watch it and let yourself laugh. And it's it's the brain doesn't allow you to um, laugh and be sad at the same time. So even if you watch something hysterically funny for 30 minutes, you've given your brain a mental health break, so you can and get some happy endorphins going, so you can go at it again. So we had some suggestions for activities for kids with special health needs, and one was to just helping your child be educated about his or her health problems so they can explain it to others. And then I put in chat rooms here, and as Becky pointed out, we want to be careful with chat rooms. Um, there, there are places like on, um, the American Diabetes Association has chat rooms for kids with diabetes. There's chat rooms for kids with cancer. There's a variety of chat rooms, but don't just turn your kids loose on whatever chat room because there are a lot of bad ones out there too. But think about there are, if they're homebound for a reason, ways they can socialize, ways they can talk to other kids with similar health needs. Um, and the internet does provide that, especially in rural areas where you may be isolated from those things. And I, and I think one of the advantages that we have now is there's more and more kids that are Skyping. Um, we've had kids that have been on homebound programs who've actually been able to Skype into their classrooms. Um, so really using technology in a positive way um, can be key for these kids to stay mm -hmm. connected. And then, and then another good one are summer camps for kids with spe specific health needs. Um, cancer camp, diabetes camp, asthma camp, places like that where their health needs are cared for, but the parents can, you, you the parents can have a break, and the kids can play like real ki regular kids. So think about that kind of thing for them as well. Um, okay, let's talk about adolescents. And uh, this, this is probably the scariest time for many. <laughs> um, when, when romantic relationships start cropping up, peer relationships become more important. Um, some of the issues with, with health care needs and disabilities is delayed sexual and physical maturation can make this period of time more difficult. Um, Self-image problems. Um, and here I think back to the choose your battles. You know, if kids are, are having some delayed maturation to let them have clothes that typical teenagers wear, what kind of public behaviors, you know, pick what, what's important. If they want to have green hair, um, it may not be nearly as important as some of the other things. And letting them have green hair like all the other kids may be a, a positive step to joining in and be part of the rest of the group. Um, but there are issues with weight and eating disorders sometimes crop up during this period of time. So you do want to keep track of your child and if they change their eating patterns, um, it might be a concern. But autonomy is also an important piece here. Um, the, the transitioning and the treatments for health um, to the adolescent, looking at their health beliefs, their, which have to be balanced with their personal goals, you know, it's difficult being a diabetic teenager when everyone else goes to McDonald's. And how can they do that? And occasionally they will, they will ignore their health needs um, because of their desire to fit in as, with their peers and to help them figure out how to do both. Um, and then there's all the risk behaviors that adolescents, you know, try out. And in a lot of ways, I mean, experimentation with some risk in teenage years is a healthy mental health behavior, um, as long as it's not excessive. But if, you, if they don't try some things, you know, you wonder because it's pretty normal. But watching for the drugs and the sex issues. And that's, in, when I work um, with families, that's the biggest question that I usually get with adolescents and teenagers is, when should I worry? You know, what is normal, typical teenage development that kids do and we just have to kind of go through those phases with them and when is it a problem and you know when should I be concerned because it was sometimes it's hard to tell you know wh when the child has stepped over that line and 
I think this is the best time to bring this up. When should you worry? <laughs> um, and I think that's the biggest, I think Becky's point here too, is, is when things change, when your child suddenly spends more time in their room or suddenly has a new peer group or suddenly doesn't want to be at school or does grades shift from good to bad, um, the school starts calling you up with problems. Um, you know, those are the times when, when you, you want to ask yourself, should I be worrying now and should I talk to my child um, do we need to have a conference here? Do we need help from the outside? And I think the things that we look at as mental health professionals, changes in mood, extreme sadness or withdrawal that lasts longer than two weeks, or sudden mood swings that affect relationships. I mean, teenagers do have mood swings, but if it's starting to affect their relationships or it's lasting for long periods of time, you want to be concerned. If your child suddenly has difficulty concentrating, sitting still, focusing, I mean, if it's been a problem all along, that's one thing, but if it suddenly shows up, you want to, you know, I mean, if you, you want to look into it. Um, intense feelings, overwhelming fear that interferes with daily life. Um, behavior changes like fighting, out of control, school changes, school performance changes, unexpected weight loss, um, physical harm, in other words, suicidal thoughts and behaviors, um, cutting on themselves, any physical um, um, self-mutilation, that's the word I'm looking for, or substance use, finding that joint or pill in their drawer is a sign to do something. <laughs> um, and there's, I put a website on here, at the, it's a Mayo Clinic um, website that has a nice discussion of mental illness in children and some of the things to look for and expands on some of our descriptions here um, that you can find. Um, and then people often ask, who should I go to? Who should I ask for help from? And I thought I'd just briefly give you um, sort of the differences between some of the prof mental health professionals. And I guess from this list you can see I'm a psychologist because I put myself first. Um, <laughs> I, uh, psychologists are, have doctoral degrees, but they're, they're PhDs, Doctor of Philosophy. Um, we do what some people call talk therapy or behavior therapy. We focus on the person and the environment and work with them to help them fit in, fit those things together more effectively. and. Um, to change thinking, to change interpretations of situations. We do not prescribe medication. Um, on the other hand, the psychiatrist or the psychiatric and the psychiatric nurse practitioner, the psychiatrist is a medical doctor. The psychiatric nurse practitioner has a, a license as a nurse practitioner with special training in, in psychiatric medications. And both of them prescribe medication they may do some psychotherapy, but not much in general. You probably would work together with a psychologist or a counselor. And then the counselors, there's a variety. I've only listed two. Um, social work, a licensed clinical social worker, or a licensed professional counselor, both of which usually have a master's degree, although they may have a doctoral degree. Um, they have special training in, in issues of everyday living, um, and providing people with help um, and counseling. They also do not prescribe medications, but may work closely with a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner. And then finally, the schools. Most schools have a school counselor, a school psychologist, as well as other programs, IEPs. Um, I think within the schools, because that's where kids spend a great deal of their time, when children are struggling socially and emotionally or they're struggling with their mental health or their health issues, having the school on board is, is crucial. Having the teachers understand um, what the child needs, you know, having a good written plan, whether it's an IEP or a 504 plan or a response to intervention plan. You know, there's several that can happen, but really having the school on board so they can also offer support and services be another set of eyes, be another um, other people for the child to connect to um, because 
that's where kids go. I mean, they're in school, and so having the schools on board with our students is, is really important. So here, I, the last couple slides here are simply websites and places you can go to for um, more information and help. The Mayo Clinic, um, the National Institute of Mental Health has a whole question and answer section for parents. Um, there are pamphlets on different, um, they also have pamphlets on different mental illness um, for parents. Um, and then some other internet resources um, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh has psychological complications of chronic illness on their website. Cincinnati Children's has a whole section for problems in helping ch teens with chronic illness. University of Rochester, the American Psychological Association, and then National Jewish in Denver. Um, so if you have other questions or want more information, um, I think this is in a couple places, but here's the website for um, Project Uplift that Becky works for and also WIND, the Wyoming Institute for Disabilities. And finally, so Dr. Bowen and I would like to thank um, all of you for joining us today and for more information and materials on this very important topic um, and any other health care topics that you may be interested in for children with special health care needs. Um, please visit Wyoming Family to Family Health Information Center website. And I believe that is listed. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>